This meeting is being recorded. Okay. Right, I don't, I need, my, go. right. good evening, everyone, and mm -hmm. welcome to another CAS webinar. Tonight, we have space news from Roy. Then our main speaker for this evening is Gordon Mackay, whose presentation is entitled Controversies in Astronomy, Part 2. Our next webinar is on the 11th of April. Uh, I've still arranged a speaker. I'm going to e email the, oh, the BAA one uh, director that does radio astronomy. So I think that would be quite an interesting topic to see if they can give us a talk on that. All right, so that presentation and title and everything still to be arranged. So, right, so now it's over to Roy for Space News. Thank you, Neil. Just the usual second or two while I try and get the right screen and make it work. Okay, hopefully you can see <coughs> the, the screen now and whoever's coughing, if you'd okay. like to mute yourself, please, that'd be handy. Uh -oh. and whoever's blowing their nose, if you could mute yourself as well. That. Yeah, I can see the screen, Roy. Okay, thank you. Ready. The, in radio astronomy, circle-shaped objects are pretty uncommon. Or sorry, I'll say that again. <laughs> Circle-shaped objects are actually very common. Since the few cyanized gas often emits radio light, objects such as supernova remnants, planetary nebulae, and even star-forming regions can create circular arcs of diffuse gas. In 2019, astronomers began to discover radio circles they couldn't explain, in part because they're so large. Known as odd radio circles, or orcs, they're roughly a million light years across, which is about 10 times wider than the Milky Way. Observations show that orcs are centered around an elliptical galaxy, which suggests a galactic connection. It's been suggested that orcs were formed by shockwaves triggered by a powerful event, such as a gamma ray burst or fast radio burst. But given the size of the orcs, these events would need to be triggered very far in the past. And shockwaves can typically be seen in other wavelengths, such as infrared and x-rays, but orcs are only seen in radio light. But a new study suggests other possible origins. Using the Muirkat radio telescope, the team captured new data from one of the six confirmed orcs, creating the highest resolution image so far. This revealed ring structures not previously seen. The team also measured the polarization of light from the orc, which helped them narrow down possible causes. Based on the observations, the light is consistent with that of a synchrotron radiation. This occurs when charged particles are caught within the magnetic field. As the particles spiral along magnetic field lines, they emit a faint radio light. This often occurs with diffuse plasma, and it suggests a spherical shell of gas was pushed away from the galaxy, either through a rapid period of star production or the merger of supermassive black holes. Another interesting possibility is that orcs are formed by the galaxy's supermassive black hole directly. Active galactic black holes, or active galactic nuclei as they're common known, is cause, often cause jets of material to stream away from a black hole at nearly the speed of light. Over time, these can create vast radio lobes, where long ejected plasma glows in radio light. One idea is that orcs are caused by radio lobes oriented along our line of sight. Rather than seeing ejected plasma as a lobe, we would see it as glowing radio arcs. While this study has narrowed down the possible explanation for orcs, there isn't one clear solution. But the team is undertaking further studies to look for more clues. And when future radio telescopes, such as the Square Kilometre Array, are completed, they're bound to discover even more orcs. In 2014, the Japanese space agency JAXA launched the Hayabusa 2 spacecraft to visit asteroid Ryugu. It arrived at the asteroid in June 2018 and studied it from orbit for over a year. Hayabusa 2 even dispatched four rovers to the asteroid's surface. After departing, it flew past Earth in December 2020, dropping off a sample of Ryugu. Of all the scientific results from that impressive mission, 
The most interesting one might be this. Asteroid Ryugu might not be an asteroid. It might be the remnant of a comet. The Hayabusa 2 mission showed that asteroid Ryugu was a rubble pile asteroid. Instead of being one large monolithic chunk of rock, it's a conglomeration of smaller rocks. Like some asteroids, it's shaped like a spinning top. The asteroid's rapid rotation forged it into this shape. Researchers say that a widely accepted formation scenario for Ryugu is a catastrophic collision between larger asteroids and the subsequent slow gravitational accumulation of collisional debris. A lot of Hayabusa 2's evidence supported the idea that Ryugu is an asteroid, which astronomers assumed was the case since its discovery in 1999. But one thing stood out amongst the evidence that didn't fit with the asteroid definition. Ryugu has a high concentration of organic matter. If Ryugu is a rubber pile asteroid created from the collision of two smaller asteroids, then why does it have so much concentrated organic matter? In their paper, the authors say that not only might Ryugu be the remnant of a comet, but similar rubble pile asteroids might also be former comets. Asteroids, astronomers call these objects comet asteroid transition objects, or cats. Comets form in the distant cold reaches of the solar system. Unlike asteroids, which are all rock, comets are icy and contain rock and frozen volatiles. The volatiles are mostly water ice, but they also contain frozen carbon dioxide, ammonia, methane, and carbon monoxide. Astronomers sometimes call them dirty snowballs. Comets also have unbound atmosphere. When they approach the sun, the warmth melts some volatiles, creating an atmosphere, and then they sublimate out into space. The atmosphere contains dust as well as volatile gases. After passing close to the sun many times, some comets have lost all their volatiles to space. What's left is just rock, and that's why they're sometimes called extinct comets. If Ryugu is indeed a former comet, can that account for its characteristics? Ryugu rotates rapidly, which could stem from its previous life as a comet. Ice sublimation causes the comet's nucleus to lose mass and shrink, which increases its speed of rotation, said the lead author, Mayuru and Impressilis. As a result of this spin-up, the cometary nucleus might acquire the rotational speed required to form a spinning top shape. According to Dr. Mayura, the extinct comet hypothesis can also explain the high organic matter content. The organic molecules detected include carbon monoxide, carbon dioxide, methanol, carbon sulfide, formaldehyde, formic acid, methane, and cyanide. Additionally, the icy components of comets are thought to contain organic matter generated in the interstellar medium. These organic materials would be deposited on the rocky debris left behind as the ice sublimates. Comets like Ryugu have the same organics as carbonaceous chondrite asteroids, but they are concentrated on the surface. The local concentration might account for the extremely high organic content inferred from the albedo, the paper states. The research team tested their hypothesis with numerical simulations. They calculated how long it would take for a Yugo to lose all its volatiles and become a rocky remnant. They also calculated the increase in rotational speed required to shape the asteroid into what it is today. Her calculation suggests that Yugo was once a comet and active for the first several 10 kilo years and spent the rest of its dynamic lifetime as a rubble pile asteroid, the study says. This scenario is consistent with the dynamical evolution of modern comets in the solar system. The study focuses on asteroids with three characteristics, spinning top shape, rubble pile composition, morphology, and a high concentration of organics. The results show that Ryugu and similar asteroids are comet asteroid transition objects. Cats are small objects that were once active comets, but become extinct and apparently indistinguishable from asteroids explained Dr. Mayra. Due to their similarities with both comets and asteroids, cats could provide new insights into our solar system. Hayabusa 2 returned its Ryugu samples to Earth, and another mission will soon do the same. NASA's Osiris Rex spacecraft visited the asteroid Bennu, an asteroid very similar to Ryugu, and will return its samples to Earth in 2023. Analysis of these samples should confirm 
whether Aegu and Bennu are asteroids or cats. Sunspots are one of the ways we can measure the activity levels of the sun. Generally, the more sunspots we observe, the more active the sun is. We've been tracking sunspots since the early 1600s, and we've long known that solar activity has 11 year cycle of high and low activity. It's an incredibly regular cycle. But from 1645 to 1715, that cycle was broken. During this time, the sun had entered an extremely quiet period. This has come to be known as the Monter Minimum. In the deepest period of the minimum, only 50 sunspots were observed, when typically there would be tens of thousands. We've never observed such a long period of quiet since, and we have no idea why it happened. The problem with trying to understand solar cycles is that you have a sample size of one. You can track sunspots all you want, but all that tells you is how one particular star behaves. You can never be sure if the sun's behaviour is typical for a star or unusual. The only way we're trying to find out is to look at the cycles of other stars. Ideally, astronomers would love to count the sunspots or star spots of other stars over time, but this isn't easily done. We can't observe the surface details of sun-like stars, and sunspots are typically small compared to the size of the star, so they barely decrease the brightness of a star over time. Random fluctuations in solar brightness easily overwhelm any change in brightness due to star spots, but there is a way to measure stellar activity indirectly. We know that sunspots correlate to the magnetic activity of the sun. The more magnetically active the sun is, the more sunspots we typically see. It turns out that this magnetic activity can be measured using spectral lines. In the ultraviolet range, there are two particular lines known as H and K that are affected by magnetic activity. So if you measure the HK lines of a star over time, you can measure the rise and fall of the star's activity. It just so happens that Mount Wilson Observatory started measuring the HK lines of about 400 stars in 1966 and carried on measuring them for three decades. In a recent study, a team of astronomers combined the Mayer Wilson observations with more recent data from observatories such as Keck to measure the activity cycle of 59 stars across 50 to 60 years. They are able to confirm the cycles of 29 of them by observing at least two full cycles. No small feat given that some of the stars have 20 year cycles. We also found that some stars have no cycles at all, but one star is particularly interesting. Known as HD 166620, the star typically has a 17 year activity cycle, but since 2003 it's been quiet. This is the first example of another star experiencing a long term quiet period similar to the Mondo Minimum of our sun. HD 166620 is about 80% of our sun's mass and about 6 billion years old. A bit smaller and older, close enough in size and age, the dynamics of the two stars should be similar. It isn't clear why HD 16620 has entered a quiet period, but further observations will be able to measure its magnetic activity in greater detail. In time, we might also observe the star as it leaves its quiet period and returns to a 17 year cycle. It could then provide the data we need to understand why the sun was once quiet for decades. One of the biggest surprises of the 13-year Cassini mission came in Enceladus, a tiny moon with active geysers at its south pole. It's only about 500 kilometers in diameter, the bright and ice-covered Enceladus should be too small and too far from the sun to be active. Instead, this little moon is one of the most di geologically dynamic objects in the solar system. A new study has modelled how this activity could be taking place, and what mechanism might power the geysers spewing from its tiger stripe figures. While previous studies have indicated some type of unknown internal heat source on Enceladus, the new study infers no heat source would be necessary. Max Rudolph from the University of California, Davis, and his colleagues suggest that the cracks in the ice shell caused by changes in Enceladus orbit around Saturn would allow water from the subsurface ocean to leak out. In a state of active cryovolcanism, the researchers propose the water spontaneously boils when it hits the vacuum of space. 
Cryo volcanism is a relatively newly found phenomenon, initially discovered by the Voyager mission's travels to the outer solar system. Instead of hot, molten lava like volcanoes on Earth, cryovolcanism spews out water, ice, and other materials in environments that could be hundreds of degrees below freezing. For example, temperatures at the surface of Enceladus rarely rise above minus 200 degrees centigrade. Cryovolcanism has been observed at Jupiter's moons, Io and Europa, as well as at Celadus and other icy moons. While Io appears to be outgassing sulfur dioxide, other moons are erupting with water, methane and ammonia. Rudolf and his colleagues said they modelled the orbital and internal evolution of the ice-covered ocean worlds in Celadus and Europa across 100 million years of time. The eccentricity of the moon's orbits leads to varying thicknesses of their ice shells. As the ice thickens and thins, as the team said, thermal stresses in the ice shell and pressure in the underlying ocean will change, promoting the fracturing of the ice shell, creating the tiger stripe fissures. This takes place as the ice cools and thickens. The pressure exerted on the ocean below will create stress on the ice, since ice has more volume than water. The pressure and stress would cause cracks, and create pathways for fluid to reach the surface, as much as 20 or 30 kilometres away. The sublimation of water as it hits the vacuum of space gives the appearance of jets when there aren't any. Rudolf said in a press release that this is consistent with the appearance of the surface of Enceladus, which doesn't show any evidence of cryolava flows leaking from the cracks on the surface, which are found in an eye. Enceladus appears to be unique in the tiger stripe cracks are not found anywhere else in our solar system. They're parallel and evenly spaced, and about 130 kilometers long and 35 kilometers apart, and they appear to be continuously erupting with water ice. But the mechanism identified in this new study of ocean pressure and spontaneous eruption can't really explain the cryovolcanism that may be happening in Europa, Rodeo said. Further research and observation of that moon is needed to determine the potential causes of those eruptions, since their models don't show cracks reaching the subsurface ocean on that moon. The upcoming Europa Clipper mission should provide more insight. This new study, however, does not address previous studies and data which indicate that the South Pole is warmer than expected, just a few feet below its icy surface. And what keeps the interior of this tiny moon warm enough to support a liquid subsurface ocean? One of my favourite subjects, Ingenuity. Ingenuity, the head helicopter currently zipping its way around Mars, is often featured here in Space News. After completing its 21st mission and being on the planet for a little over a year, Ingenuity's handlers have officially extended its mission in the hopes that it will continue its amazing groundbreaking performances. Perseverance, Ingenuity's rover companion, is transitioning into its second scientific campaign where it plans to travel 130 metres up from the Jezero crater floor to a dried up river delta. Here, it will focus on one of its primary missions, searching for evidence of ancient life on Mars. And Ingenuity will help lead the way. Even Ingenuity's path to the river delta, which isn't limited to staying on the ground, won't be easy. It will likely take three separate flights to get a new staging area in the delta including one that goes around a hill that rises off the crater floor. During this time, it will help scout a pathway for Perseverance to take, including providing information to decide which of two river channels the river should take to reach the delta itself. At the same time, it will continue its own exploration program, including looking for geological features of interest and scouting landing zones for the eventual Mars sample return mission that will be landing in the same general area to pick up the samples Perseverance has collected along its way. It will also be updating its own software. Some software upgrades have already allowed the helicopter to exceed its previous maximum height of 50 metres. Additional improvements include the ability to change speeds and adjust better to changes in terrain, all of which enhance the overall efficiency and safety of the helicopter itself. Ultimately, the smarter Ingenuity becomes, the longer its mission can last and future improvements to obstacle avoidance and terrain maps are still in the cards. But ultimately, any flights past this point are still just icing on the cake. 
I remember thinking when this all started, we'd be lucky to have three entries in my logbook and eventually fortunate to get five. Now at this rate we're going, I'm going to need a second book, said Havard Grip, Engineers' chief pilot at JPL. So far, the little helicopter that could has travelled almost five kilometres and spent 38 minutes up in the air. The next step will be a 350 metre journey towards the River Delta, scheduled to take place round about now. So far, the Ingenuity team has done an outstanding job making a complex task into a wildly successful one. And now it's time for them to keep going. As always, thanks very much to the Cosmo Crest and Universe Today people for the podcast and newsletter that gives me the up to date information that I use to compile the Space News presentation. That's Space News for tonight. Right. Thank you for that, Roy. That was very interesting. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. 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 As always. Right. <laughs> Now it's over. Is it? Sorry. Is there any questions for Roy? <laughs> Hi, Jim. Yeah. Um, tonight's talk, I think, is called controversies in astronomy. Yeah. Well, I would tell you straight off the bat, I don't believe a word of what you uh, reported about the the asteroid. I mean, I appreciate you're just reporting it. Um, <laughs> Perhaps you could send me a, the details of the paper so I could have a read of it. Yeah, my first sure, reaction yeah. is this can't be right. Yeah. Uh, we know that Hayabusa fired a, a bullet into the surface of, uh, of the, yeah. the target asteroid and blew a new crater. And there was no evidence of any volatiles coming out. So either this thing is completely dried out or they're just not right. So Perhaps you could send me some link to the paper or something, yeah, sure and, I'll, and I'll take a read of it and perhaps mm -hmm. report back in a month's time when I've yeah, had a think. Yeah. But my yeah. first reaction is, I don't believe this. Sorry. <laughs> Thank enough. you. Thank you for drawing it to my attention. <laughs> well, this is really good, John. I want, I want this enough. for part three. <laughs> <laughs> Somebody else has got a question. John's got a yeah. question. Yeah, mine is on the side. Well, it's not really a question. I don't expect you to answer it, Roy, but... Yeah. Um, this thing about the particles flying off and the spin rate increasing, oh, I've never really thought answer, about that, but um, no, it's not the same as a skater's arms because they're attached permanently to the skater. I'd have thought the angular velocity goes, is taken away by the particles as well. No, John probably knows, know. he's a physicist, we'll try John on that one. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, the spin-up could be caused by the Yarkovsky effect, which is yes. where the sunlight arrives on one side and, and optical yeah, photons I, are reflected and then infrared photons... Yes, yeah, I understand that, more, John, but um, the statement was definitely... It was due to the particles, the, the asteroid shrinking as the particles fell off or evaporated. Yeah, well, like I say, before I, before I do a Will Smith here, uh, let me read the paper and form a <laughs> considered opinion. Um, yeah, we'll, we'll wait for your report at the next meeting then. <laughs> yeah, I'll try. I'll try and get a read of it because if it's true, it's very interesting. Because yes, you know, I don't yeah. want to blow my own trumpet here, but you may remember in 1983, Simon Green and I discovered Phyton, which is the parent body of the Geminid meteors. There's a lot of speculation that that was a dead comet. So this is some subject in which I'm really quite interested. Mm. Um, so I'd like to, but I'd like to read the, uh, I'd like to read the paper before I make. I wonder if I get sit on a, a turntable or, a, a, you know, a turntable and start throwing tennis balls out, if I'd spin up or not. You know, that's a good experiment. But... <laughs> yeah, yeah, no, I understand exactly what you're saying. But mm. let me mm. let me go and read, let me go and read the paper before I try and pass judgment. Let's not be fair to Roy. All he's doing is reporting what <laughs> yes. somebody else has written. It's not, his fault. it's not his fault. We're not arguing yes, with him. Yes, exactly. <laughs> Don't shoot the messenger. <laughs> That's right. Aye. Aye. Or, that's or that's your defence, Gordon, is it? Or as Will Smith yeah. did. Don't, don't shoot me Smith. either. <laughs> or as Will Smith did, don't shoot, don't <laughs> slap the messenger. Yeah. <laughs> right, now it's over to our main speaker, our observing coordinator, Gordon. Thank right, you. so let's show Gordon the usual... Kaz, welcome. Thank you. Okay, can you let me share my screen then, Roy? You should already have that. Okay. Yep, we've got it. Yep, can see it. 
You got it? Yep. Yes, we can see it. That's it. Okay. Perfect. Okay. Um, well, thanks a lot for letting me uh, come to part two. I, th I don't know if um, you all saw my controversies in astronomy part one. Um, and at the time, I suggested that, you know, our subject is so full of controversy and that there's probably room for parts two, three, and four. So I've now completed part two and uh, I'm now working on part three. So um, maybe there'll be a part three in the, in the near future. So anyway, a wee bit about me, if people that don't know me, um, I'm a software engineer by um, profession, working for a long time in the, in the aerospace and defense industry. I was eventually director of engineering at Talis. Um, and there I went on to specialize in Wi-Fi and mobile network forensic engineering. Um, and building in that, I was working with government security agencies, uh, although I can't tell you about that. And uh, law enforcement in the UK and the USA, especially post 9-11, the New York terrorist attacks. I was involved in uh, tracking terrorists and criminals using the wireless networks. I'm now trying to retire if they let me, um, and I'm studying astronomy at UCLan. Um, I, I've always been an avid uh, amateur astronomer. I've got my own observatory now down in the borders with a 14 inch SET and a, I'm writing a whole lot of software uh, to do a variety of uh, astro data processing tasks. My favorite astro work is exoplanets and space rocks. And I'm working with uh, quite a large number of groups now writing software to process data from a variety of sources, including the BAA, PanStars, the Minor Planet Center and others. And uh, one or two snippets of my work in tonight's presentation. So um, just a quick word, if any of you who saw my part one, there was a big controversy about the Hubble Vesto Slifer. Uh, there weren't confrontations, but basically uh, Hubble was given much of the credit for the discovery of the distance cosmic expansion rate relationship, when in fact Slife, Vesto Slifer and a number of others had already done a lot of the groundwork. And some people felt that um, Edwin Hubble hadn't given proper acknowledgement or credit to these earlier workers. And it turns out that um, just before he died, Hubble had the uh, presence of mind to send Slifer a letter acknowledging that he had in fact used Slifer's data. So I think that was, um, that was a really good thing for Hubble to do and at least a, a small wrong has now been put to right. So what is a controversy? I think it's important to understand this is controversies are not just ordinary discussions or arguments. A controversy is a prolonged public disagreement or heated discussion. Um, and in, in the subject of uh, within astronomy or cosmology, an awful lot of very clever men have got pet theories and have worked long and hard on their work. And more, for most of them, it's a pride and joy. So when there's any dispute, they tend to become a fairly heated and prolonged and often public. So those are the things that I'm going to concentrate on. So it's... It's always, it's always thought that cosmology and astronomy in general should be hotbeds of controversy because of the, the very nature of the subject uh, and the amount of work and effort that goes into the science. And in my view, the science is, uh, is greatly enriched and progress is encouraged. So in part one, I covered a number of uh, important issues and in this part two, I've chosen a few more, and here they are. Um, I'm going to cover the Bohr-Einstein debates, which were centered in quantum theory. 
The second one is uh, extraterrestrial life and the many worlds. Then the multiverse and the many universes, which really comes from the second. Then the next one is the planethood of Pluto. Then the Titus Bode Law. Then uh, car the, uh, the, the uh, subject of carbon chauvinism. And then Hubble Bubbles. Then the Dyson Sphere. And finally, um, Vulcan, the hypothetical planet. So these are the ones that I've chosen for this part too. So first of all, the Born, um, the Bohr versus Einstein. This was the great quantum theory debate where we had two heavyweights of, uh, of physics getting themselves entangled with each other because they both passionately believed that their view of things was correct. And basically, um, Einstein didn't think that the quantum theory was was complete. He thought it was it, it was incorrect in some ways. Um, he wasn't quite ready to say by how it was incomplete, but there was an argument which evolved over time, in which both of these uh, guys made their their personal views clear. So the this is a a, a, a controversy that involved just um, Albert Einstein and Niels Bohr, and this was a contemporary cartoon that appeared at the time, which quite clearly shows it as a boxing match between the two gentlemen. And in fact, um, like most boxing matches, this particular argument went several rounds. You know, both uh, Albert Einstein and Niels Bohr are, of course, prominent physicists and both Nobel laureates. And it could be said that these gentlemen are super heavyweights, you know, if you were to carry on with the analogy of a, a boxing match. So you have to understand that between these two guys, there were fundamental and deep differences between them. Einstein didn't believe that quantum theory was complete. So if you look at these uh, statements from, these are quotations actually from uh, first from Niels Bohr, the entities don't actually exist as particles until someone goes looking for them. The act of observation causes existence. And this is a part of quantum theory that a lot of us, including myself, have got uh, difficulty with, that uh, something uh, doesn't exist until you actually go observing it. And of course, Albert Einstein retorted that an electron is an electron, and just because someone isn't looking at it, it's still there, wherever there happened to be. It goes on. Niels Bohr would say, it's wrong to think that the task of physics is to find out how nature is. And Albert Einstein would reply, what we call science has the sole purpose of finding out what is. So you can see that these uh, ideas are an exact opposite to each other. So you can see that there was a great distance between these two men, fundamentally, as well as, well as uh, in the uh, particular subject of quantum theory. Now, the, the argument and the discussions between them happened prior to and during the, the great Solvay debates. And the Solvay debates were normally held in Belgium every three years other than in times of war. And these were genuine science congresses, originally by invitation only, um, held so that the great and the good in the field of physics could assemble to discuss the great open questions of the day. And uh, you know, when you look at the attendee list, it's obviously, it reads like the who's who of the world of physics. And I often thought that in fact, if you weren't invited to one of these things, it must have been really demoralizing for these great men and women. Proceedings were uh, a serious affair. You can see that from the, the picture here, that this is uh, everybody's properly and appropriately dressed. And um, the um, great arguments are put over over several days. Um, proponents and opponents retreated to their hotel rooms to lick their wounds, to save our victory, or to steal themselves for the next round. And I often thought, well, you know, it sounds like a bun fight to me. You know, however, some of the greatest advances in physics 
have been made at or around debates at Solvay conferences. Here's Max Planck. Um, here's Marie Curie, you can see in the picture, and uh, Albert Einstein. So I think it could be said that um, Albert Einstein had thrown the first punch earlier because he didn't, he, he agreed that light is an electro, uh, electromagnetic radiation. But around 1905, he began attributing particle-like behavior to light quantity. He, he wasn't alone in this, uh, this idea, but he began publicly saying that, the, that light quanta were behaving like particles. And to many, this was a case of shock and horror, of course. You know, the, and Bohr, uh, amongst others, vigorously opposed it. Now, we know that James Clark, James Clark Maxwell, the Scots mathematician, solved the equations of the familiar oscillation of electric and magnetic fields, as in the diagram on the left here. And he found that waves propagated at the speed of light and deduced that light must be a wave. And that was great until um, in 1923, Arthur Holly Compton here on the right, demonstrated Compton scattering which could only be explained if light could sometimes behave like a stream of particles. Uh, and here's a diagram showing the Compton effect where uh, the energy, part of the energy of a photon is transferred to a scattered electron. Um, and of course, this meant that, that indeed, a light could sometimes behave like a stream of particles and Einstein was proven right. And Bohr was uh, reluctantly, but eventually forced to accept it. So round one in this contest of uh, wills, of intellectual wills, had gone to Mr. Einstein. The controversy gained momentum at the fifth Solvay conference. You know, this is another um, few years later. And here's the, uh, the photo call for the fifth. I, I love these... Uh, these pictures actually of, uh, of the, 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 the photo calls for these congresses, you know. And uh, I think it may be quite a good competition to put one of these photographs up and say, okay, can anybody identify who all these people are? So this is the photo call for the fifth congress. There's one woman uh, in the picture, that's Marie Curie. And there's, uh, uh, there's actually one Scotsman, that's C.T.R. Wilson, who is the inventor of the cloud chamber in this photo. Now, the fifth congress was all about electrons and photons, which is probably something that most of us feel we know at least a little about. So here's Max Planck again. Here's Marie Curie sitting in the front row. Here's uh, Albert. Uh, here's Bohr sitting in the second row. And this is uh, CTR Wilson sitting uh, in the front row. So the controversy simmered on until the sixth uh, Solvay con Congress, and this really was round two of the ding dong. And the proce proceeds were dominated by argument and counter argument over quantum theory. There were mind experiments involving pieces of apparatus that were created in the imagination and desperate attempts to find others to agree and long stressful nights in hotel and hotel rooms agonizing over the arguments. And here's, uh, a diagram actually of one of these um, one of these thought experiments that we're, most of us are probably familiar with. This was Einstein's box, which is uh, a piece of apparatus which is intended to show that if you opened a shutter and allowed a photon to escape, then there would be a reduction in the weight. You know, now to most of us, we say, "Oh, dear me." That's, uh, but you've got to remember that this is a thought experiment. And it's one of those things, if you rub Nelson's column long enough with a feather, it will fall down. So it's that kind of thing that, um, that it's probably true, but would we see it? Well, absolutely not, but it's a thought experiment. So by the sixth Solvay conference in 1930, Bohr cleverly turned one of Einstein's rel relativity theories against him. Um, and won the argument. Um, so it was a case of, uh, of him being hoist with his own petard. So Bohr's quantum theory has now become written into physics, uh, although there still remain a few issues with it. 
nevertheless, Bohr had won round two and the argument, and there wouldn't be a rematch. However, the, these two gentlemen remain mutually respectful friends for the rest of their days. So that was a really important uh, controversy. Um, and the way in which these arguments are won and lost is, is really important to our science. So the second controversy I want to talk about is the plurality of words and extraterrestrial life. So what was this one about? Um, this is the debate now lasting many hundreds of years over the plural, plurality of worlds and the existence of extraterrestrial life on those worlds, ultimately evolve, evolving into the plurality of universes. So who was involved in this? Well, this goes way back to the, the Greeks, um, the, uh, you know, the, 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 the ancient philosophers, Epicurus, Plato, Aristotle, Copernicus, then a coming through time, Galileo, Kepler, Gordiano Bruno, the Office of the Inquisition, William Whewell, Carl Sagan, Frank Drake, and others. There is a long list of people involved in this one. And it's important to realize that in this particular controversy, thoughts can kill, uh, as we shall see. Uh, and it's, uh, it's been the case throughout the history of our science that with most evolving sensitive ideas, thinking individuals had to tread warily, not, not just because they don't want their reputations to become uh, left in tattered ruins, but lest they be ridiculed, persecuted, or even worse, executed, uh, which has happened. Every, every step was controversial in an evolution of thinking until finally we had observational proof at least of the existence of other worlds. However, the jury is still out on the plurality of universes, uh, which we'll come to in, um, later on in this talk. So I've attempted to show you here that this uh, particular idea is an evolving, uh, both evolving and a controversial idea. So basically the plurality of worlds is there must be many planets. And if we go down through history, we'll find that against this on the left-hand side, Plato and Aristotle were fairly firm that there can only be one world. Equally, um, on the right-hand side, for the idea were the ancient Greek thinkers, Epicurus and the atomists. And even the, um, the very important contribution that we sometimes forget in astronomy of the medieval Islamic thinkers. Then, you know, again, uh, against it, as we come through time, the rare, the rare earth hypothesis of Ward and Brownlee and William Freewell. And on the right hand side, we had people like Gordiano Bruno, Copernicus, Bernard de Fontenelle, and uh, philosophically, David Lewis, although he wasn't a co cosmologist. And meanwhile, uh, people like Kepler sat on the fence, although they, he, Kepler tended to tended to agree that there would be other, there could be other planets, but he didn't, he, he wasn't quite ready to stick his reputation on it at that time. And then as we go down further uh, on the left, we had the anthropocentric thinking, which affects so much cosmological and astronomical thinking. Um, and we had the rare earth equation, which was uh, brought out in response to Frank Drake's famous Drake equation, which attempted to um, estimate the number of habitable planets that there might be in the Milky Way. So to, to offset this, the rare earth people brought out, brought out a similar equation to show that there was hardly any, if possibly only one um, place like earth where there could be life. And um, at the same time, the, there was a great thing called the mediocrity principle which uh, was basically a principle that said that, that you know, human life uh, or intelligent life is commonplace. In fact, it's mediocre, it's so commonplace. Then coming further forward in time, there was an explosion in exoplanet discovery, of course, and that really put the hatchet through um, any ideas that, the, that there couldn't be more than 
uh, one planet. Not and uh, not not that the, these planets might be inhabited, but at least if there were more planets, and there was a chance that some of them could be inhabited. Um, and this move forward in moving towards the idea that well, you know, if there are more than more than one planet, if there are many planets, are there many universes? So it is for some people, it evolved into this idea that there must be more than one universe. And that's a complex argument that we'll come to. But again, um, against this argument with people like Paul Steinhardt, David Gross, Paul Davis, uh, Roger Penrose, one of my favorite cosmologists, is against the idea of a multiverse, but favors cycles of time. Uh, and, also, and absolutely for it were people like Brian Green and Max Tegmark, who produced interesting classifications of universes, and Stephen Hawking. Um, so you see, this is this is this has gone on for a couple of thousand years. This idea to arrive at where we are now, but it's interesting to look at this uh, mediocrity principle because Stephen Hawking was a a a a believer in the the, 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 the mediocrity principle. In fact, he, he rather scathingly said, the human race is just a chemical scum on a moderate sized planet orbiting around a very average star in the outer suburb of one among a hundred billion galaxies, you know, gulp. You know, so um, there was no doubt about what his view in this was. But uh, in response to this, you had the likes of, uh, David Deutsch, you know, saying, well, hang on a minute, old chap. You know, um, Earth's neighborhood in the universe is not really typical. 80% uh, of the universe's matter is dark matter uh, or dark energy, and that a concentration of mass such as the solar system is an isolated, uncommon phenomenon. So you see, these are, uh, these are, these uh, principles are directly in opposition to each other. Um, but equally firmly believed by either party. So those against the, uh, the argument put up a really well-prepared argument. You know, the rare Earth hypothesis, for example, demands that there has to be the right environment for complex life, and this is rare. There has to be the right location in the right galaxy. It has to, you know, the planet has to be the right distance from the right type of star. There has to be the right orbital arrangements of the other planets, and some of them even believe that there has to be a Jupiter-type planet, you know, to do uh, the marshalling of the, the particular stellar system. There has to be a stable orbit and perhaps even a magnetosphere. It has to be a terrestrial planet of the right size. There has to be a large moon, uh, and tides were deemed important, so is water important? And there has to be evolutionary opportunities and triggers. Now you can see from this, hang on a second, this is all basically just a recipe for planet Earth. Um, you know, so, so these people are arguing, well, you know, if it's not planet Earth, then it just won't do. Um, but that's a very anthropocentric idea, uh, attitude to take. So uh, some would argue that this is entirely anthropocentric, you know, and throughout history, uh, throughout the history of, uh, of science and, and, and particularly our science, humans find it difficult to think beyond our immediate experience and environment. And that's, uh, that's perfectly understandable. Um, but we should spare a thought for poor old Giordano Bruno. He was a Dominican friar and uh, a champion of free thought. And he was ultimately burned at the stake by the in Inquisition in 1600 for his belief that there was more than one world. Um, however, you know, I should point out, it didn't help his case that he also didn't believe in the virginity of Mary, the Holy Trinity, the divinity of Christ, transubstantiation and eternal damnation. So I think you could say he didn't stand a cat in hell's chance of getting past the office of the Inquisition. He believed that the universe is infinite, has no center, uh, and that there are many stars with many worlds full of animals and inhabitants orbiting them. And of course, many people now subscribe to that view for which this poor chap 
had to give his life. Uh, and it's interesting that while he was in England, he published his De L'Infinito Universo et Mondi on the infinite universe and worlds in 1584. Uh, and there's lots of good bedtime reading on this subject. Um, I think Bernard de Fontenelle's Conversations, is a, it's actually a beautiful and unusual book supporting the idea of many worlds uh, because he wrote it as if it was a conversation with a lady who had no knowledge of astronomy. Um, and that's well worth a look at. David Lewis, of course, uh, one of the most important philosophers of the 20th century, supports many worlds, but he's not talking about cosmic pluralism. He's talking about many worlds in the mind, the, the, the sort of philosophical mind view of it. Whereas William uh, Whewell's uh, harsh criticism of the plur plurality of worlds uh, although he slightly, he slightly leans towards the possibility of other planets, but not life. So you see there's a fair range of uh, passionate thinking on this uh, subject. And, you know, obviously, ultimately, controversy morphs uh, somewhat quietly into conspiracy. Uh, and you get the likes of Dr. Stephen Greer who has uh, formulated the CE5, the Close Encounters of the Fifth Type Protocol, um, as a means to conjoin with uh, extraterrestrials using extrasensory perception uh, and meditation. And he seriously pursues uh, this uh, subject. He organizes uh, groups um, who who carry out meetings according, you know, using the, the CE5 protocols and they're claiming direct contact and the ability to cause extraterrestrials to appear at various locations as in the photograph bottom right in Texas. There's quite a, a, an interesting um, documentary available on Amazon Prime at the moment about Dr. Greer and his CE5 groups. Um, his principal objective in all this is he's demanding an end to conspiratorial secrecy over UFOs and ET. He wants governments all to come clean so that we can all start afresh. Uh, and in his words, he's demanding complete disclosure. So uh, you can see that this subject is not without its controversy, and some would say the controversy is growing. But anyway, this is one controversy that is at least partly over because the existence of other worlds is a confirmed fact, although the existence of life in other worlds is yet to be confirmed. And here is uh, my own recent work um, along with Martin Crow uh, relating to the uh, transit of exoplanet Corot 2b uh, and its bizarre rapidly orbiting hot Jupiter. And it was interesting during Roy's talk that he was talking about um, the activity of the sun um, and whether there was similar activity on other stars. And in this particular star, Corot, Corot 2 has got um, a difficulty when it comes to analyzing the transit of its exoplanet because it has such a large number of uh, sunspots, stellar spots, uh, and they cover a significant area of the, 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 uh, the stellar disk. Uh, and in fact, the, uh, the transit light curve on the left, which we recently produced from 500 images, shows a curious bump in the middle and then another dip. Um, and this, um, uh, uh, we hope that our studies will eventually show this, this may be due to the fact uh, that there was the movement of a stellar spot of some considerable size during that particular transit, because the timing is not the same as the timing which was uh, which was estimated by the mission, the ESA mission that first discovered the exoplanet. So, um, yes, controversy which is to somewhat over because we know about other planets so but it rages on in terms of other life now the third uh the third controversy i want to look at then naturally follows on from 
the plurality of worlds. And this is the plurality of universes. So this is a various theoretical scenarios ranging from alleged parallel, the parallel existence of multiple universes to the existence of multiple universes beyond our detectable local universe and the mechanisms bringing them about. So who is involved in this one? Well, this has been going uh, for time immemorial, beginning with the Greek atomists. And more recently, you know, with um, cosmologists like Roger Penrose, Max Tengmark, Brian Green, Paul Davis, Steen, Steven Weinberg, and others. So um, it's best that we start with the most favored sequence of events, and that is the Big Bang leading to the Lambda CDM, the Cold Dark Matter Universe, uh, with which there are some problems, um, not least. Uh, there are some difficulties reconciling quantum variations, that's patchiness. Um, the early expansion may have breached relativity laws. There's a question about matter antimatter symmetry, you know, asymmetry, you know, things like, well, you know, the, uh, the prevalence of matter was due to a small disparity in favor of matter whereas the antimatter was responsible for the actual uh, exp the initial expansion, the, the energy of expansion. There's a flatness problem. Why, why has there been no big explosion or big crunch after so long? And what, what happened before the Big Bang? And these are all problems in some cosmologists' eyes. And then there's a difficulty of language. So if you consider the following statement, you know, prominent physicists are divided about whether any other universes exist outside our own. So it begs the question, is the universe the infinite everything or just the result of the, of the Big Bang as we observe it? Or are there other Big Bangs now or never? You know, so the definition of what constitutes a universe or the universe becomes a little confused. And for the purposes of progress, this is one thing that many people needs, think needs to be resolved. Um, and things, you know, if it is resolved, things may be more controversial than we think. So there are several individuals who have uh, devised classification schemes. And the first that I want to mention is Max Tengmark's three levels of universe where uh, he says there could be an extension of our universe. There could be universes with different physical constants. And if physics isn't hard enough with uh, lots of different physics, this is going to be quite a headache. There is uh, the many worlds interpretation from quantum mechanics. So these are the different levels that Max Tengmark um, proposes. Brian Green proposes nine types. So he's got the quilted universe. This is all possible things happen an infinite number of times in an infinite universe. So basically we've all been here before and we'll all be back again. So then there's the inflationary universe that the collapse happens in various pockets in the universe to form new universes. And he's got brains, which is short for membrane. Uh, and in this idea, universes float one above the other in membranes and sometimes they touch. Um, then the cyclic uh, universe, this is multiple membranes collide in big bangs. So there's, there's many big bangs as these, uh, these brains collide and they're pulled back in time to repeat. Um, and I think this might be a, a cunning device actually to explain other things. Then there's the landscape uh, universe he proposes, which are like hills and valleys where universes dip down to areas where physical laws differ. Then he proposes a quantum universe where new universes form, where there's a diversionary event in the quantum field. You know, and that's, uh, that's a great part of the original uh, Big Bang and the original expansion theory where you, you had the, uh, where you had the, the different um, the different interatomic uh, forces dividing out at important times in the expansion of the, of the universe. 
then in, then there's a holographic universe where universes are surface encoded. You know, the mind boggles about that one. Then there's a simulated universe where actually universes exist in complex computer systems. So we're all part of some mad gigantic computer program. And then finally, there's the ultimate universe where every possible universe under every possible variation of physical laws will exist. And you know, this is a, this is a, 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 this is a massive sore head, you know, to try and think through these things. Now, when it comes to sequential bangs and crunches, I, I spoke in the controversies part one about Julian Barber, and Julian Barber believes the universe proceeds in a series of bangs and crunches, but they're not big bangs. Each one begins at the Janus point, he calls it. And for him, uh, the, 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 the Janus point isn't a singularity. It's, it's the beginning, uh, like in the beginning of the, the traditional uh, bang. He, he, he kind of favours the same as Roger Penrose, where entropy is the driver. We reach a maximum entropy state. And that's the, the entry point for the next uh, crunch. But you know, this, is, attracts, this attracts much criticism, as you can imagine, from Lee Small, Small and Carol and others. Uh, he actually, by the way, uh, it's worth noting that Julian doesn't believe in time. He, he believes that time is, illusion, is an illusion. And this thing, um, this thing propagates uh, in a series of what he calls nows. You know, and these nows all, you know, together placed one after the other give this impression of time. Um, I've actually read his uh, new book, Timeless Physics, which is um, a really interesting read. Then there's uh, the big, the bangs and crunches everywhere idea that, that produced this kind of chrysanthemum type diagram where uh, material flows with increasing acceleration gravitationally into the most influential gravity sinks for the next crunch. Um, and, you know, you would say, well, you know, if this is true, we would observe skewing in the expansion, which according to the European Space Agency in 2020, we have now observed a, a skewing of this data. Uh, and that makes the, it may explain increasing expansion rates and the, and the missing 70%. You know, I've, I've heard a couple of physicists saying, well, you know, there'll be no need for dark energy in this case. So who knows? It's an exciting prospect. Uh, and again, on bangs and crunches everywhere, uh, Andrei Lind, the Russian theoretical physicist, physicist proposed that multiple universes formed in bubbles of inconsistency in the original Big Bang. And an awful lot of... Uh, there's been an awful lot of consternation about the fact that there, there is inconsistency, inconsistency in the Big Bang. How did that happen? And what might the result of it be? Well, he reckons that one of those results is that we have multiple universes uh, and lots of mini universes in pockets with different laws of physics. You know, so um, again, uh, quite a thought. Stephen Feeney suggests uh, that there's evidence for collisions between universes in the WMAP data in, uh, in 2007. And actually Roger Penrose's new book, uh, Cycles of Time, similarly mentions the fact that there is uh, evidence in the cosmic background radiation for pre-Big Bang collisions between black holes. So that's a, an interesting idea. Um, However, re rework of the WMAP data plus Planck data couldn't find significant evidence of external gravitation uh, attra uh, attraction. Uh, however, it has to be said that that was external gravitation out with the expansion expected due to dark energy or the cosmological constant, depending how you look at things. So that in itself is, uh, is, is minimally controver controversial. So as with everything, you know, there's uh, science spin in politics. Paul, Paul Davis in 2003 said, arguments about multiverses are non-scientific. And, uh, you know, I'm just an amateur astronomer myself, but I don't have a great deal of time for people that try to limit human thinking. Uh, and this particular one, I think, is a bit about spin in politics within cosmology. 
uh, George Ellis, the South African uh, professor in 2011 said, not a traditional scientific theory. And we need an open mind, though not too open. Um, you know, which again, I would say, well, hang on a second, you know, we're supposed to be thinking here. Um, it sounds a little bit Orwellian to me. So, uh, but then when does conjecture become faith? I see the point, you know, that, that these things uh, become a leap of faith. However, um, the controversy uh, rages on. Then there's uh, this curious behavior of matter and anti-matter. And, you know, if, if you, like me, are uncomfortable with the idea of parallel universes, uh, how about uh, considering this? You know, when, when scientists were looking at the, the, at the very nature of vacuum, of the vacuum of space, you know, what is in it? You know, you know, there has to be something there because although sound waves aren't propagated in a vacuum, light certainly travels through it. So they were trying to find out what quality of vacuum um, allowed uh, light to pass through it, and they were trying to uh, they were trying to find out about this ether, the transmit the 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 ether which could transmit light, and in fact Paul Dirac uh, eventually is eventually become to be known as the Dirac C because people realised that you know in a vacuum that particles and antiparticles appeared and then self-annihilated. Um, and just a very, very short time later, particles were continuing to appear uh, under antiparticle and then self-annihilating. Um, and then uh, there was a very interesting article in Scientific American about uh, a decade ago that if you introduced the the uh, event horizon of a dark of a of a black hole and it was so positioned so that uh, when a virtual pair um separated into the particle and antiparticle that if one or two of the pair was inside the schwarz the Schwarzschild radius inside the event horizon then it couldn't get back to its partner um, in order to produce the self annihilation and the 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 virtual pair was seen to tunnel backwards in time quote unquote you know so this idea about parallel universes you know what does this uh, little ex this little observation say about time and dimension and perhaps you know the idea of parallel universes is not so wild as might be imagined. So the next uh, controversy is something a little bit closer to home. This is the planethood of Pluto. And I know a lot of us um, feel very strongly about this one. And it's uh, the raging argument about whether Pluto should have been downgraded. And now, uh, particularly following the horizons, um, the, the horizons probe, whether it should officially remain a dwarf planet or Plutoid, as the IAU suggested, or be reinstated as a planet. Uh, and basically involved in this is the, the IAU, Alan Stern was very vocal in this, and the Great Planet Debate of 2008. So um, for many of us, this was a dastardly decision you know, by the IE, how dare they do this to our, uh, to our, our Pluto? And uh, Alan Stern was quite vocal and he's the director of the New Horizons mission and perhaps well-placed to have an opinion. And he said, well, the definition stinks for um, technical reasons. And the new rules for planethood were as follows, the object must be in an orbit around the sun. The object must be massive enough to uh, to become rounded by its own gravity, and more specifically, its own gravity should be able to pull it uh, into a shape um, according, you know, by its own hydrostatic equilibrium. 
And thirdly, it must have cleared the neighborhood around its orbit. Now, this, uh, this um, new definition um, has landed the IAU into hot water since many astronomers, uh, planetary astronomers, um, argue that rule three um, means that, um, you know, the Earth, Mars, Jupiter, and Neptune all share their, ob their orbits with asteroids. And it could also be argued that our moon is a planet by this definition. Um, it's also been argued that fewer than 5% of astronomers were in favor uh, of this decision. And some states, governments, and organizations have absolutely refused to comply with this decision and still um, call Pluto a planet. The great planet, the great planet debate in 2008 at John Hopkins Univers University couldn't agree on a couldn't agree on a definition. And in 2008, possibly in response to this, the IAU announced that the term Plutoid would be used for Pluto. Um, it's not a term that I've used myself, and it's not a term that I've heard many other planetary astronomers using. Um, New Horizons has shown that Pluto is a very complex planetary environment. And then, of course, we, we find more trans-Neptunian objects that are, are, are pushing the boundaries of this uh, definition. And it's a shame because Pluto is the only world to have been named by an 11-year-old school uh, girl, Venetia Burney, at, in Oxford. So it must have been very disappointing for her. And of course, the, 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 this, this brings in this problem of large trans-Neptunian objects. And because they're uh, increasingly remote, of course, it takes us longer to discover them. Um, and some of these, uh, uh, these have been listed, and I've given the list on the left here. And some of these are large, are very large, and have satellites. Uh, Mike Brown, who discovered the TNO Eris, uh, is against uh, Pluto's planethood, while um, other, other minor planet discoverers have petitioned um, against the definition. Uh, progress has shown that our solar system is very complex from a planetary perspective. So it might be that we were just a bit too hasty in downgrading Pluto. And uh, some proponents for Pluto's planet, planethood have argued that if we really apply the new rules to the to the letter of the law, then there might be around 150 planets in the solar system. And with these increasing discoveries, there is mounting pressure to reinstate Pluto. Um, but my final comment on this one is, uh, so where we've got to now is uh, Pluto, okay, it's now a dwarf planet, which means a small planet. So for me, it's no change then. Pluto was always a small planet. Okay, so uh, the next controversy I want to uh, touch on is the Titus Bode Law. So what was this one about? This was about the success and failure of a formula intended to predict the uh, spacing between planets in our solar system, and then ultimately between planetary systems elsewhere, and even uh, systems of planets with their moons. And the people involved in this were, um, amongst others, Johann Titus, Johann Bode, of course, the, after whom the law is named, Thomas Kerda, Mary Blagg, uh, D.E. Richardson, and D. Gregory. So what's uh, this, this actually about? The Titus Bode law, as most of us probably know, attempts to rationalize the observed spacing between planets in a solar system or a planetary system via a predictive formula. And the basic law holds that the distance of a planet in the solar system from the sun will be twice as far as the preceding planet. You know, so in terms of the mass, the formula is A equals four plus X, where A is, a is the semi-major axis and X is the series 0, 3, 6, 12, 24, et cetera. Uh, and the progression ratio in that is two. Um, and there's absolutely no doubt that it would be really helpful to planetary astronomers if this, if the Titus Bode law was found to be generally true. And I think 
many of us want it to be true, but it's not just a case of desire. It has to be proven. Now, there's a bit of history to this one. Uh, and to be honest, it's a little bit of a tangled mess. It's one of these things that we'd love to be true. It would be really handy if it was true. In 1760, Thomas Kerda in a text produced the Kepler third law derived mathematical succession. Um, but it was, uh, it was uh, equal, to, but not equal to two, and it was harmonically increasing. So it was similar, but not the progression was not quite equal to two. A possible series was mentioned in another text by D. Gregory in 1715. Uh, and a similar text in 1724 was attributed to Wolf. In 1766, one of the, uh, the, the, the people after whom the law is named, Johann Titus, he added to a 1764 Bonnet text suggesting that the succession in planetary distances matched their bodily man magnitudes. That's an interesting thought. Uh, and Titus noted that there was a space where a planet was predicted between Mars and Jupiter, which of course we know what occupies that particular space now. In 1772, Johann Bode embellished the Titus text with a footnote arriving at, at a, a more empirical formula, but this time based on a succession of the planetary distances. Many precedents have been found for this, actually. So the thing has been under discussion by uh, a large number of people for a long time. In 1912, Mary Blagg revisited the law and this time included satellite systems of the gas giants. And she arrived at a progression ratio of 1.72, not two. And in 1945, D.E. Richardson arrived at the same conclusion. Then along comes uh, Dr. Michael Nieto uh, in 1974, and he did not mince his words. Uh, he says, we have to know whether the Titus board law of planetary distances is indeed a law. If it's not a law, then clearly the law says nothing about anything. We can skip the rest of this talk, drop the discussion and concentrate on something useful like Watergate. So he, he made his feelings well known. But in actual fact, um, uh, Dr. Nieto had something fairly um, sensible to suggest. He, he, was, he mused that these early successes for the law were coincidences. Um, and it didn't really handle the failures of Neptune and Pluto, which were slightly off piste as far as the, 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 the law was concerned. He found an oscillation around a geometric prog prog uh, succession suggesting two processes were at play if you look at the diagram on the right. He theorized, and I think quite plausibly, that the geometric succession dates from the condensation of planets out of the original accretion disk, and the oscillation arises out of post-creation interplanetary tidal effects, which is a fair suggestion. Um, the basic message is that planetary dynamics of the solar system are evolving and complex, and a law must be able to keep up. Uh, and that, of course, is fundamentally correct. So what then and what now for this particular controversy? It's concluded that the Titus Board Law is a rule rather than a law. And it's possible, even probable, in any stable planetary system. Uh, however, as more and more exoplanetary systems are discovered, the Titus Board Law has proven to approximate the position of exoplanets. Uh, some uh, exoplanetary um, scientists have even used it to successfully approximate the location of thus far undiscovered planets. Uh, and it's been used to search, search for missing planets. But unfortunately, the law has never proven to be precise enough to warrant being a true law. And further serious study into new variants of the rule are banned by most institutions, which seems a little controversial. Okay, so the next one I want to um, talk about is carbon chauvinism. Uh, and this is an attitude prevalent amongst many, but opposed to the idea that, uh, that, that carbon-based extraterrestrial life forms are possible uh, since carbon, uh, carbon chemical and thermon, thermodynamic properties make it superior to all other elements. So who is involved in this? Well, people like 
Carl Sagan, Victor Stenger, Julius Shiner, and Stephen Hawking. So is there an alternative to carbon? Um, how about silicon? Uh, if we compare carbon and silicon, both carbon and silicon are abundant, but silicon is 150 times more abundant than carbon on Earth and is one of the most common elements in the universe. Carbon forms compounds easily with hydrogen and oxygen and other atoms and, and ions. And it forms the very important long chain molecules called alkanes that form uh, much of carbon-based life. Does silicon do the same? Yes, it does. It forms molecules with four other elements easy, easily and long chain silanes. Biologists have coaxed silicon to replace carbon in various enzymes and organosilicon compounds are now found in a wide range of products. So, you know, so yes, again, similar to carbon. Can it be used, uh, can it be used uh, with water, can use with water as a biological solvent? Yes, carbon, yes, of course it can. Can silicon do the same? Yes, it can. But it can also use methane and ammonia, prevalent in many extraterrestrial environments. How about evolutionary mechanisms? Well, for carbon, these are well-trodden and well-trodden well pathways and well-documented. For silicon, scientists and astrobiologists using directed evolution to directly synthesize and to cause other organisms to create organosilicon molecules. So you see there's a, a great many similarities between silicon and carbon. And silicon is more abundant. And the atmosphere uh, and the environments in which silicon can, uh, can be active um, includes some of the most common uh, components of, of uh, atmospheres on other planets. So having a close look at carbon and silicon as far as their stereochemistry is concerned, because the shape of molecules is really important to um, life forming mechanisms. So you see on the, the left is the characteristic tetrahedral stereochemical shape of methane. And it just so happens that on the right, silicon forms the same uh, tetrahedral stereochemistry in the silane molecule. So again, very similar chemistries. The most, so the most obvious candidate for alternative to carbon is silicon. So if we look, this chap on the, the left hand side, this is Homo sapiens um, that we all know and love. Uh, it's an intelligent, adaptable, vicious, predatory, superstitious, and warlike primate. Top of the evolutionary tree based on carbon and alkanes, and it thrives in an oxygen rich atmosphere. How about this fella? Okay, this is science fiction, but not so far-fetched. Um, this was the silicon-based xenomorph in the Alien movies, and it was portrayed as being the product of an egg-laying queen and voracious hordes of workers, the top of an evolutionary tree based on silicon and silanes. Oxygen-rich atmospheres are probably not conducive um, to the more reactive silicon-based molecules. But as I said before, um, these can thrive in uh, methane and ammonia-based ammonia, ammonia -based, uh, atmospheres. So uh, I wouldn't discount. It's, it's probably true that an awful lot of science fiction uh, has, a, has a tendency to become science fact. But the question is, uh, could life be even more exotic? It was Carl Sagan who coined the term Calvin chauvinism and admitted to probably being chauvinist himself since we ourselves consist of carbon and water. But in the same breath, he, 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 he said that aliens could consist of plasmoids. And now there's an idea, because if you look at the, uh, uh, the structure of the, the magnetic fields and the solar wind around about our planet, there is in fact a plasmoid 
uh, downwind uh, of planet Earth. And a plasmoid is, uh, is defined as being a coherent structure of plasma and, and magnetic fields. Could it be uh, defined as life? Then there's radiobes. And these are cell-like objects observed in radium irradiated gelatin solutions and thought that they could in actual fact be alive. Then there's things called lavobes. These are microorganisms capable of living in molten rock. And then there are things called thermophages, which are bacteria-like microlife. Now, a chap called James Gould writes that most dictionaries define life as a property that distinguishes um, the, the life of the dead and define dead as being deprived of life. Now that's a somewhat circular and unhelpful uh, definition. Uh, however, there is no mention of carbon. And finally, Victor Stenger, the US astronomer, argues that life need not be constructed from molecules. So exotic and controversial. The next uh, controversy I want to cover is Hubble bubbles. So what's this about? The, this is the ongoing argument that the much vaunted Hubble constant related to cosmic expansion at a specific place and time may not be the accepted local value. Uh, now there's lots of people involved in this particular one. Zahavi et al is a nice paper, Conley et al, another nice paper, Moss et al, another good paper, and the astronomers, they're all involved in various arguments about Hubble bubbles. So Hubble bubbles are basically regions where the rate of cosmic expansion differs from the generally accepted local value. In this particular image on the right, the, the galaxy NGC 4526 is alleged to be in a great void uh, of unusually sparse galactic numbers. Um, and much, I think I covered this in uh, Controversies Part 1, but much hangs on the general consistency of space because all the elegant mathematics that, that uh, defines um, the expansion of space does rather rely on um, the homogeneity and the consistency of space. And this is increasingly under attack. Uh, great voids of up to 900 megaparsecs and immense structures up to 700 megaparsecs have been discovered. So the, uh, the homogeneity of space is, uh, is under attack. Um, and the laws and, uh, and, and mathematics um, based on that are then also um, therefore under attack. So Hubble bubbles are basically under densities, um, places where the the number, the, the, the density of, of, of structures and galaxies is, is smaller than elsewhere, um, possibly developing from minor post Big Bang inconsistencies. Um, some have even said perhaps the entire universe is an under density which would dispense with the, the need for dark energy. Uh, but this idea has also been labeled absurd. Uh, as I said before, ESA has published data showing that there is a, a skewing of, uh, of cosmic expansion and inevitably some wish to bash the, current, the Copernican principle by insisting that the Milky Way is in an area of special under density. So getting back to this idea that we occupy a special place when the Copernican principle tries to tell us that we don't. Um, so in this diagram on the right, this. Uh, is uh, an attempt to depict uh, an under density causing gravitationally provoked movement um, towards areas of higher density, thus varying local expansion rates and expected redshift red shift velocities. So uh, perish a thought, but Halton Arp's quantum redshift ideas might not be so wide of the mark. Um, the next um, controversy I want, this is a, a one-man controversy, actually, the Dyson Sphere. So what is this one about? Well, the Dyson Sphere is a highly controversial conjectured structure built by an extraterrestrial um, 
civilization around its star or a star to capture all or at least part of the star's radiant energy. Uh, and there is actually current activity to search for telltale signs of Dyson sphere. So who's involved? Well, one guy, Freeman Dyson. And here he is, um, his picture on the right. I think he, he, Freeman Dyson is one of the most interesting faces in the whole of uh, our science. And this is uh, on the left, a graphical rendering of a Dyson sphere composed of orbiting panels around a star. Uh, it's been suggested that the existence of a Dyson sphere structure would increase infrared radiation from the host star. And this is the basis on which some um, astronomers and researchers um, are looking for the possible ex uh, existence of Dyson structures. Uh, and funnily enough, there have been some false alarms, which is, uh, which is uh, you know, is amazing. So a Dyson sphere built around even a small star would, of course, be an undertaking of epic proportions. It would be a megastructure. Um, Dyson spheres could be all-enclosing spherical structures like the one uh, on the left. Um, and I've left a hole in it to show you that there's a star in the middle there. Uh, and on the or on the right, it could be just a, a belt-like structure of, uh, of orbiting panels. The fact is that if you think about ourselves, you know, a large constellation of satellites might be less or only slightly daunting. Um, and this is dubbed a Dyson swarm. So if we think about ourselves, our own sun and our possible motivations, you know, to achieve interstellar travel, humanity requires an awful lot more energy than can be found on Earth. And our sun emits a vast amount of energy equivalent to trillion, you know, several trillion nuclear bombs every second. And if we were to um, plan a, a swarm of satellites uh, constructed from Mercury's orbit, each covering a square kilometer, these could surround the, uh, the sun and provide us with, with infinite um, energy. And in fact, only 1% of the sun's energy, energy could supply us with 200 billion times what we currently have. So you can see that there is, uh, as a thought experiment, you know, there is at least uh, some motivation for, for contemplating this. You know, some have even argued, look, everything that we need to build the Dyson structure uh, exists in Mercury. It's rich in iron and nickel. Although I don't, I don't fancy being one of the construction crews going out to, to do this. Mercury's low gravity would allow us to launch satellites using rail guns. You know, they're, uh, they're, 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 that would simply simplify the, the, the business of launching satellites. And these satellites would have solar collectors and, uh, and they would beam energy using energy beaming uh, technology, which, which we don't yet, uh, which we haven't yet invented but this would be uh, required. So I've shown here on the diagram on the, uh, the left, uh, what a, a Dyson swarm would potentially look like with respect to uh, Mercury's orbit. Um, it's been suggested that that's what it might look like. And I've left, um, I've, I've, I've only shown part of it for clarity. So the last controversy that I want to touch on is the, is Vulcan, the hypothetical planet. So what was this about? This was, uh, this was the assertion that only an undiscovered planet closer to the sun than Mercury could explain Mercury's peculiar orbital characteristics. So who is involved in this one? Um, French guy called Urbain Le Verrier, Francois Arago, and Edmond Modest Lescarbeau. So, how about the discovery? Yes, it was discovered. Uh, Vulcan was first proposed by the French mathematician Urbain Le Verrier to explain orbital peculiarities uh, in Mercury, which we, of course, uh, we now know what causes these peculiarities, but then they didn't know this. And Edmond Modeste Lescarbo claimed to have observed the transit of Vulcan in 1859. 
and <laughs> it's amusing. He discounted it. Uh, they discounted the transit um, as being caused uh, by actually by a sunspot because it moved. You know, I think if we told Lynn that, she would laugh her head off. You know, Le Leverrier announced the discovery of Vulcan in 1860, and he received the Légion d'honneur from the, the French uh, government, no less. Now, here's uh, a map showing Vulcan um, inside the or orbit of Mercury uh, in, a, in a, a map produced in antiquity. Verifications for it poured in. Um, Kappel Loft reported a transit in 1818. Uh, Greuthausen reported two black dots in 1819. Interestingly, also saying they couldn't be sunspots because they moved. Pastoff observed the black spots in 1822, 1823, 1834, and 1836. Uh, F.A.R. Russell and others observed a transit from London in 1860. And Richard Covington saw a similar event from Washington, USA. A Mr. Loomis of uh, Manchester um, observed a transit in 1862 uh, and even uh, estimated the orbital period um, for the transit. And this was all actually verified um, and calculated as 17 to 19 days by two French astronomers. Now, actually, 17 to 19 days is not an awful lot different from half the orbital, the, the um, spin rate of the sun. So it could well be that they mistook uh, this for sunspots. But finally, um, our favorite Vulcan assures us that yes, it does exist because he was born there. However, there is an epilogue to this, uh, of course. Professor James Craig Watson and Lewis A. Smith were both experienced astronomers. Um, they claimed to have observed an intramercurial planet during a total eclipse of 1878. However, CHF Peters, who himself was quite a controversial figure, was having none of it and mocked the discovery. But the epitaph to all this is that rather curiously, the International Astronomical Union continues to reserve the name Vulcan for the as yet unverified or undiscovered planet. And that's the end of controversies part two. And there may be a part three. So I hope you can join me for the next crunch and bounce in part three. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. That was that was really that was really interesting. Yeah. It was fabulous. Hi, it was I. <laughs> <laughs> Fabulous. <laughs> I'm glad you liked it. Yeah, brilliant. Any questions for Gordon? I remember, I remember, I'm just the messenger. <laughs> <laughs> Don't shoot me. <laughs> oh, so the messenger was Mercury. Yes. <laughs> Wind, of course. Yes. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Well, at the risk of doing more trumpet blowing, um, I was pretty heavily involved in Kuiper Belt work back in the '90s and 2000s, and I was at the IAU meeting in Prague, mm -hmm. where this huge debate went on for days, and it was really quite an interesting sociological thing to watch. And for many years afterwards. Uh, Susie Ramsey and I did a talk called Is Pluto a Planet, in which I played Boring Old Fart and she played Bright Young Thing, uh, bouncing ideas around, you know, is it round, has it got a moon, and showing yeah. that whatever definition, whatever definition you employed, um, it wouldn't work. You know, there's always an accident. Whatever definition you choose, there's always something that doesn't fit. Mercury doesn't have a moon, you know. Yeah. As you say, the, the, the Kuiper belt hasn't been cleared by Pluto, but then Maybe the Earth hasn't cleared its space either. So that's a never-ending uh, argument. Yeah, it's never-ending. My, my view is that you know, if you want to, if you want to study Pluto as a distinct object with glaciers and what have you, then it's a planet. And if you want to regard it as a test particle for what's going on in the outer solar system, then it's not. And and this argument is pretty pointless, actually. What it really shows is that we're a lot cleverer than we were 
in the 1930s. Yeah. So it's not a failure. I mean, people say that we've got it wrong. No, no, astronomers haven't got it wrong. Astronomers are just a lot cleverer now than we were uh, back in the 30s when it was mm. first discovered. But I mean, yeah. anytime you want an hour on whether Pluto is a planet or not, let me know. <laughs> I can easily dig out my slides. They're actually on acetates, but I'm sure, yes. I, could, I'm sure I could make them into a trial. I have got Mike Brown's, Prof Brown's. <laughs> yeah, yeah, well, he's, I mean, Mike, and, I mean, I met he's Mike. He's a, a genius. I, I, I did his um, science in the solar system um, free online course, you know, Mike Brown. And a lot of students clubbed together and bought them a palisite. I put it on a meteorite. Aye, aye. Oh, it, it yeah. was over the moon. It was Did over the moon. Did you well. know? I mean, Mike discovered Eris. Did aye, you know that uh -huh. Eris, Eris is the Greek god of controversy and discord? <laughs> yeah. Which was a mm -hmm. particularly apropos title for it, given that it was right on the borderline with Pluto in terms of diameter. Mm -hmm. Yeah, don't get me started on this. The other thing, of course, the chair of the IAU at the time was Jocelyn Bell Bell Nell. Yeah, yeah Jocelyn, not remembered for. <laughs> yeah, Jocelyn chaired some of these. Uh, I mean, they started off the first one mm -hmm. like about day three, and it was, I don't know, subcommittee G or something, which normally does complicated things like adding a leap second on, on Jupiter or, or defining the rotation of some satellite as positive or negative. So they, you know, they had a room with about 10 seats in it and about 400 people trying to squeeze <laughs> into it. And I remember the chairman saying, well, it's cheery, cheering to see you're all showing so much interest in the work of subcommittee G. And, <laughs> and then uh, over the next few days, you know, they finished up in the biggest hall in the building having this huge debate. Mm. So the final vote was after most people had gone home as well, wasn't it? It was on the yeah, last day. That is correct. I, in fact, was not there on the final day. Mm. By then, I'd been in Prague for already ten or twelve days, and you now I started to. My wife was starting to get a bit anxious about me coming back. And I know there was some long argument about whether the amendment was taken before or after the main motion or something. I yeah, it was as well. It was, was that a, procedural. Yes. Yeah. yeah I would just, say, yeah. Yeah, Just in right right now, I thought was doing a great representation of a headmistress at the time. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, she was she was very Jocelyn, I thought. I mean, I could write a book about it. Well, I have actually. Um, you know, but yeah, it's an interesting problem. Well, write it, John. I'll buy it. No, no, it's called. I wrote a book called Beyond Pluto in about two thousand, which which actually has a chapter called Is Pluto a Planet? So it's the book's a bit dated now because. Obviously, we've moved on a lot in the last 20 years, but at the time, I was quite, quite pleased with it. Beyond Pluto by John Davis, Cambridge University Press. Mm. Okay. It's mostly about the Kuiper Belt, but there is a there is a there is a chapter on whether Pluto is a planet because it was a hot topic at the time. It's not so much now. Any other questions? Mm. Or has everybody just tried to take in all the information <laughs> and digest it? I've, I've, got, I've got one question for Gordon. Yeah. You talked about um, carbon life on Earth. Yes. Why wasn't there silicon life in the very early Earth before oxygen came along? Well, Lots of, it meets all your conditions, you said. Yeah, that's, that, that's a good question. And the... Um, I, I've seen something on this, and in actual fact, it's a case of what are we looking for? You know, when you set out to look for carbon life, you you're, you're, you you get a bit of tunnel vision. You know, have we overlooked something? You know, earlier on because we're not looking for it, or, or it's out, it's off piste. You know. So I don't know. It's a good question. Well, there'd, there'd have to be some strange fossils that, from very early rocks, wouldn't that they? nobody perhaps recognised as a hmm. fossil. That we did recognise the fossils on Mars that weren't fossils, of course. Yeah. The fossilised bacteria. Yeah, which I is don't know. Controversy. Yeah. There's an awful lot uh, of opinion that 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 that, that were far too anthropocentric, hmm. you know, in our outlook, you know, to. <laughs> life 
which is probably true. Hmm. There it is. All right. All right. Mm, good. good. Dave Jewett, of course, told me I should have called it Beyond Neptune. <laughs> <laughs> Right. Yeah, right. Yeah. Thanks. No, I gotta go. So thanks yeah. very much, uh, Gordon. Very yeah. interesting. Yeah, thanks, I like thanks the for stuff. Listening. Of, like the stuff about Hubble and uh, Slice. So. Yeah. And I'll send that paper on to you, John, in a few minutes. Right. Right. I'd like to thank Gordon for so much for this interesting and informative presentation. And it's given us a lot to think about with all these different controversies. <laughs> Mm -hmm. And hopefully, when he's finished Controversies <laughs> Part 3, we will it's, get the next instalment. It's coming. <laughs> we'll get the next instalment. <laughs> get the next instalment. <laughs> yes, yes yeah. it's a bit like, um, when's the next series of X, Y or Z coming? It's season TV? three. <laughs> so, season three is coming. <laughs> With Gordon... <laughs> <laughs> and these controversies. Yes. <laughs> to be continued at some point in the That's future. right. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Uh, right. So I'd like us to thank Gordon in the usual way. Thank you. Thank Thanks you. for listening. Mm. Thank you.